Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us this evening for equine parasitology with Dr. Peregrine. Um, this is the first of our equine webinar series that uh, Ontario Animal Health Network or Owen is going to be hosting this year. So we're happy that everyone can join us this evening. Um, I'm Jessica Peetling. I'm a veterinarian that's part of the equine network group of Owen and I'm hosting on behalf of Owen tonight. Um, and so I just want to start by saying a lot of the topics for our Owen webinar series uh, have come from the survey data that you guys have completed um, in, our, in our quarterly survey. So we really appreciate that. And uh, for those who haven't um, had a chance to fill out the surveys, um, they come every quarter and uh, we really appreciate your input so we can know what you guys are seeing on the front lines and uh, it helps Owen to kind of direct the resources to where they're needed most. So we appreciate that. So. Um, just a couple housekeeping items for tonight. The session is being recorded and will be available on the Owen website afterwards. Um, if we can keep our microphones and videos disabled, I think they're automatically disabled, uh, but just for stability of the feed. The presentation is scheduled for roughly one hour, depending on questions, um, which you're welcome to ask at any point throughout the chat. Um, and then I, uh, Dr. Peregrine is um, gonna be fielding the, the, the questions uh, throughout the presentation. So I can read those to them as they come through and maybe we'll have a little bit of time afterwards to chat afterwards. So um, depending on the questions, it may be an hour, it may be a little bit over, but we have it scheduled to 8.30 max tonight. So um, with that, I will introduce Dr. Peregrine. So, uh, Dr. Peregrine uh, obtained his DVM and PhD from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. Um, he then worked for uh, nine years as a research scientist at the International Laboratory for Research on Animal Diseases in Kenya. And he's been an associate professor in clinical parasitology at OVC since 1997, where he teaches DVM students. I think there's probably many of us here who have been taught by him. Um, and he teaches in all levels of the program. So some of his interests include zoonotic parasite infections of companion animals, sustainable um, control of GI parasites in sheep, in sheep and horses. And he is a diplomat of the European Veterinary Parasitology College and the American College of Veterinary Microbiologists. So with that, I will welcome Dr. Andrew Peregrine. Jessica, thanks very much. Um, hi, everyone. Really good to see everyone. Um, just as a, an additional housekeeping issue, please, folks, as we go along, please feel free to ask questions um, in the chat feature. Uh, and I've asked Jessica just to keep an eye on that, uh, Jessica, and then if you can interrupt me as we go along, rather than I think waiting to the end, because uh, sometimes questions are more relevant at certain points during the presentation. It's really nice to see many names that are familiar. I'm just sorry we're not in the same place together, but hopefully that won't be too soon. What I wanted to do, what I was asked to do is focus on what I think have been the most significant developments in the horse parasite area um, over the last few years. Uh, and the focus is going to be almost entirely um, actually on small strongyles, which are by far the most important, small strongyles or cyathostomins as they're also called, which are by far the most important parasite of all horses, except um, foals under about eight to nine months of age. Um, there is a copy of this um, presentation that I've sent to Jessica. So if you want a copy of this afterwards, please feel free to contact Jessica. And as she said, it's also being recorded. So what I wanna do is focus on what have been the most significant developments as far as recommendations for small strongyle or cyathostomin control over the last few years. And I'm gonna focus number one on the most recent parasite control guidelines by the American Association of Equine Practitioners. And there's also a number of very relevant recent papers, almost entirely from Dr. Martin Nielsen at the University of Kentucky, who's actually a really good friend. And I've actually spoken to him about some of those papers for this particular presentation. So as I said, the focus of this talk is gonna be on small strongyles or cyathostomins. I wanna give you an update on what, we're now, what we now know about drug resistance to these parasites. What we now know from quite a lot of work um, has indicated 
the risk factors that strongly in, uh, select for resistance in these parasites. And in light of that, what are some of the recommendations now people are giving for strategies to reduce the risk of anthelmintic resistance developing? And collectively, I want to look at that information in the context of what are considered progressive recommendations now um, for control programs for small strong gels. And I think throughout this presentation, it's really important to ask ourselves as vets, what are we doing with our clients going forward to ensure that anthelmintic resistance doesn't worsen? Because the reality is it doesn't look as though we're going to get any new anthelmintic sclerosis. Uh, certainly in the near or even medium to long-term future. So just a quick background, uh, and I apologize for those of you that this reminds you of second year of vet school, um, but there are some important facts just to mention about small strongyles or cyathostomans. They're the primary producer of strongyle type eggs in the feces of horses. In fact, it's estimated more than 99.5% of all strongyle eggs in feces today are produced by these parasites. There's a large number of different species, but they all produce identical looking strongyle type eggs. Horses must be at pasture to acquire infection because part of the life cycle requires development at pasture. And once horses get infected, once they develop the ingest the infective form of pasture, it typically takes two to three months before those parasites mature and they start producing eggs that are shed in the feces of horses. Now, I mentioned you'll get small strongyle infections in all ages of animals, except typically under about six months of age. Typically, parasite burdens are highest in animals under about three years of age, um, but you will see disease in all ages. And we think that most of the disease um, due to these parasites are primarily due to immature stages um, that are developing in the wall of the large intestine. And in its most acute presentation, this is what results in acute larval cyathostomonosis. And most of those cases are in animals under about three years of age. So a quick reminder about the life cycle of cyathostomins or small strongyles. Um, I went online just to see how easy it is to get a life cycle for this parasite. And this is the image that it gave me for small strongyles, which is an odd image because it, it suggests the adult parasites are in the stomach, which is not true. So <laughs> the lesson for that is be careful when you're searching online. Everything else is relevant. The adult parasites live in the large intestine, and once they're mature, as I mentioned before, they shed strongyle eggs in feces. So those pass into the environment in feces. Depending on temperature, as you'll see a little bit later, the first stage larva hatches out of those eggs. It remains in the feces, feeding on bacteria. It then molts twice through to the third stage larva, and that then crawls off the feces onto pasture. Uh, and if you go out, certainly um, at this time of the year onwards, particularly in the second half of the summer when parasite burdens are larger on pasture, you may see these infected third stage larvae actually in drops of dew on the grass uh, early in the morning. And it's ingestion of those third stage larvae is how horses get infected. What's really important with small strongyles, and you'll see, I keep coming back to this, this in this presentation, um, what's really important is to recognize the fact that at certain times of the year, there can be substantive parasite burdens in the environment. In fact, more in the environment in the horse, and that's certainly typical in the second half of the grazing season. And so as you'll see, progressive recommendations for prevention of disease from these parasites certainly primarily focus on environmental management just as much as they do with respect to prudent use of anthelmintics. What happens once those infective third stage larvae are ingested? This is just a diagrammatic representation. Above the black line it represents the lumen of the large intestine, below it represents um, the mucosa and submucosa of the large intestine. The L3 or the effective third stage larva passes down to the large intestine and then it typically goes dormant either adjacent to mucosa or within the intestinal wall and it's sometimes referred to as the early third stage larva which is why it's sometimes referred to as here the, the EL3, it just means early third stage larva. 
That typically goes dormant, but after a number of weeks or months, it starts maturing uh, through to the four stage larva. And it's this development that results in what the phrase you'll sometimes hear, the insisted cyathostomin. And eventually that breaks through to the lumen of the large intestine uh, and then matures through the, to the adult. The reality is essentially every horse on pasture is effectively infected with these parasites. Whether or not the burden's high enough to cause disease um, is what I'll keep coming back to later on. But the, the damage it does to development in the wall of the large intestine, and particularly when it breaks through to the lumen, is what causes disease when there's large numbers of parasites. When there are large numbers of parasites in the wall um, of the large intestine, so these are immature stages, this is actually a post-mortem picture from a horse that came to OVC a few years ago that had acute larval cyathostomonosis. And this is just an area of the large intestinal wall that's just two centimeters by two centimeters. And you can see very readily large numbers of immature small strongyles within the wall. So those are small strongyles or cyathostomins. What are the drugs or the anthelmintics or the dewormers that we have available to control them? This is the current list. And sadly, for those of you that went to vet school, at least for the last 20 years, this list has not changed. Uh, not changed at all. We have three drug classes that are approved for controlling small strongyles and other important intestinal gastrointestinal parasites of horses. The first drug class that I'm, I'm going to keep coming back to are the benzimidazoles. And the one drug we have in that class that's still approved is fenbendazole. Uh, and the commercial products in which it's available in Canada are indicated on the right. So that's the first drug class that is approved for the small strongyles. The second drug class is just the one drug pyrantel. It's a pyrimidine, but it's a completely different drug class from the benzimidazoles. And the most recent drug class that was introduced, and ironically, that's the year I graduated from vet school. Jessica, sorry, you did indicate how um, old I am. I actually graduated in 1984. Um, and that was the year ivermectin got introduced onto the market around the world. And it's one of the two macrocyclic lactones that got approved for horses. So there's either ivermectin or moxidectin. Those are the three drug classes. As I said, the macrocyclic lactones was the most recent ones to be introduced. And they've been on the market now at least 35 years. My understanding from talking to a number of the drug companies, it's unlikely we're going to see any new drug classes coming on the market in the near future, sadly. So those are the drug classes that are approved. I think the obvious question is, what information do we have about the extent to which there's resistance to each of these drug classes in small strongyles? I've indicated on the right what our understanding was as far as the prevalence of resistance to each of these drug classes in small strongyles in North America up to about the year 2018, so up to about four years ago. From, from data that was collected probably um, 15, 20 years ago initially, our understanding certainly in the US, and there's no reason to think that we're significantly different in Canada because of the movement of horses across the border. Resistance to the benzimidazole, so that's particularly fenbendazole um, in small strongyles, is very common. Uh, some of the folks at the University of Georgia even said they think it's al almost every farm, but it certainly is very common. What about resistance to the second drug class, pyrantel? From some of the data 10, 15 years ago, it appeared to be common, not as common as the benzimidazoles. And as of 2018, there's been, there was no resistance described to macrocyclic lactones, either ivermectin or moxidectin. There was no resistance described in North America. However, um, about 10 years ago, various groups around the world have shown resistance to that drug class in country, countries such as Brazil, Italy, Finland, and the United Kingdom. So we've always been worried that sooner or later, we might see the resistance here. If you read the most recent guidelines from the American Association of Equine Practitioners, you will see the drug class they now recommend for small strongyle control is actually the macrocyclic lactones, because when the guidelines were put out in 2019, there was no resistance in North America. We're afraid, folks, that's changed just in the last few years. The first thing I think that alerted quite a few people was this paper from Dr. Nielsen at the University of Kentucky published in 2000. And 18. 
Um, what it was, was a summary of data that had been collected um, through the National Animal Health Monitoring Systems um, in the US. Um, but this, so this was a publication in 2018 of data collected across the US, 2015 to 2016. For that particular study, they'd worked with 80 equine operations across 28 states in the US, and they'd sent them everything required to collect fecal samples at the time of treatment, and then again, 14 days later. It was to look at the efficacy of treatment with drugs in each of those three different drug classes. All the um, treatments and collection of fecal samples was all carried out um, by horse owners on those operations. And the results that were reported indicated that for the first two drug classes I mentioned, those two drug class classes did not appear to be effective on just over 78 or 8% of operations. So essentially it appeared that on at least three quarters of horse operations in those states, neither benzimidazoles nor pyrantel um, were effective. To be honest, that wasn't too surprising. It was consistent with what had been described a few years earlier. But what was particularly surprising was that as far as the macrocyclic lactones are concerned, and remember that's ivermectin and moxidectin, the data that was reported indicated that they were not effective on just over 10% of operations. And the other thing that was, I think, interesting was there didn't seem to be a significant difference across the US. Like there wasn't more uh, inefficacy uh, in any one particular region. Now, when this data came out, a number of people said, well, that doesn't prove there's resistance to macrocyclic lactones because the treatments weren't carried out in a controlled manner. Well, just a few months ago, this year, 2022, this paper came out, again from Dr. Nielsen at the University of Kentucky, uh, uh, and a study that was carried out in central Kentucky on a thoroughbred breeding operation. Um, and he got involved there because the um, farm thought um, that the macrocyclic lactones they were using didn't seem to be working as they were before. And so he went out and with them, carried out what are called fecal egg count reduction tests. And I'll describe how that's done a little bit later. They looked at the response to ivermectin because that was what was being most commonly used. And when ivermectin was initially introduced, when parasites were fully susceptible, all the data indicated that you got at least a 99% reduction in fecal egg count. All right, so egg counts almost disappeared. But what they found was that the mean and the average reduction in fecal egg counts in horses uh, in yearlings following ivermectin treatment at the approved dosage was just 91%. Uh, and according to the criteria that are used to define resistance in horses, that was actually the first study to demonstrate um, resistance to ivermectin in horses bred in the US. So that was a surprise although it wasn't too much of a surprise because just two years earlier, Dr. Nielsen reported on some stu a study on another thoroughbred farm in central Kentucky, where there was very significant resistance to ivermectin in small strongyles, demonstrated the same way. The only difference was those yearlings that that study was carried out on were imported into Kentucky from Ireland two years ago. Um, so, there were concerns they'd been introduced, um, but I think it's a bit unfair to blame the Irish for all of this. Um, this was the first demonstration of resistance to ivermectin in horses that had spent their entire lives in the US, uh, and it was in the Kentucky area in thoroughbreds. So this is now a significant concern that in some parts of America, it looks as though we now have got resistance to all three drug classes in small strongyles or cyathostomins, and it begs the question, how should this be managed going forward? Because it doesn't look as though we're gonna get new drug classes. Going forward, I think there's two important things to appreciate about small strongyles in horses. The first actually is this table that was in the most recent um, guidelines from the AEP. Uh, and that is, uh, there's, there's a consensus opinion that you really can categorize horse strongyl egg counts into three levels. Zero to 200 eggs per gram, so that's 200 eggs per gram of small strongyles. Those are now categorized as low shedders. Horses with 201 to 500 eggs per gram of small strongyles are considered moderate shedders. And horses with more than 500 eggs per gram are considered high shedders. Now, the reason I put this table up is because the general consensus is 
if the strandile egg count is less than 200 eggs per gram, that um, is equivalent to a burden of small strandiles that does not require anthelmintic treatment. There appears to be no impact on horse health if horses are low shedders. And I'll keep coming back to that threshold in a minute. All right. So this is very different, for instance, from um, parascaris egg counts, where there appears to be no relationship between the number of eggs per gram and parasite burden. But for small strandiles, it's very different. Typically under about 200 eggs per gram, the general consensus horses do not need anthelmintic treatment. So those are the three categories that the AEP uses to categorize the shedding of horses. I think the interesting fact is what's on the right of this table. And that is if you look in a typical horse population, low shedders typically constitute at least 50% of the population. And the horses that require treatment, moderate and high shedders, don't constitute, certainly don't constitute more than 50%. So on average, at any given time of the year, at least 50% of horses actually don't need anthelmintic treatment, but you need to do fecal egg counts to determine that. Just some take home facts about the significance of egg shedding levels. Uh, and this comes back to the fact um, that a number of times I've been phoned up recently for, by people saying, what do we do when we have resistance to all three drug classes? in small strong gels. Um, and my comment is, um, if you can maintain parasite burdens below these two thresholds, and that's less than 200 eggs per gram of feces in horses more than two years of age, and a more conservative threshold of under 100 eggs per gram in horses under two years of age, if you can manage the environment to minimize parasite burdens, so the egg output is below those levels, then it doesn't matter if you have triple class resistance, all right? Because parasite burdens are at a level, even when there's drug resistance, there's no impact on horse health. And you'll see a lot of what I'm gonna talk through are recommendations for environmental management. So that's the first issue just to recognize. There's now um, certainly different levels of egg shedding that do or do not um, require treatment because of the impact on horse health. The other thing, um, that's just as important to appreciate is this fact. Um, and it's just, it's come up um, in multiple forums over the last 10 years or so, both in horses and particular small ruminants. And the issue um, that's referred to is parasite refugia. What does parasite refugia refer to? It refers to the proportion of the total small strongyl population that escapes drug selection at the time of treatment. And the rule of thumb is that the lower the proportion of parasites in refugia at the time of treatment, the more quickly the resistance develops. The, so the contrary to that is the greater the proportion of parasites in refugia at the time of treatment, the more slowly resistance develops. So I think the obvious question is, well, what are small strongyles in refugia? Um, what are those parasites uh, that escape drug selection at the time of treatment? Well, it's certainly always going to be all the free living stages on pasture. It typically is stages in horses that are unaffected um, by anthelmintic treatments. And the one thing that relates to that are insisted cyathostomins. Most anthelmintics do not eliminate that particular stage. And the last group of um, parasites that may escape treatment are all obviously parasites in animals not treated. So those are all the potential locations of parasites in refugia. It's the third one, I think you'll agree with me, that by far is the easiest to manipulate. By the way, folks, as we go through this, if there's anything that you disagree with, please feel free to say so. Jessica, let me know if there's any disagreements, because some of what I'm gonna say is, I think, a little bit contentious, and it would be good to hear the perspectives from people in the field. So, let me show you then how you use those two concepts um, of thresholds of egg shedding that drive the, whether or not horses should be treated, all right, uh, and the issue of parasite refugia. Um, how do you use those concepts to determine uh, what you can do to slow the development of resistance? What I want to show you is the fecal egg counts. So these are strongyl fecal egg counts for 261 horses um, on 12 farms in Denmark. It happens to be from Denmark, but it could equally well be here. Uh, and, and this is what you would typically see during the summer months. So these researchers went out, collected fecal samples from all these horses on 12 farms at one point during the summer months, and they determined the number of strongyl eggs 
per gram of feces. And what they've done in this figure on the y-axis is the number of strongyle eggs per gram. And on the x-axis is all the horses ordered by increasing fecal egg count. So you can see on the left, that's horses with no strongyle eggs per gram. Uh, and on the right, the animals with the highest. Now, this particular graph is not particularly informative because as I mentioned earlier on, the thresholds for determining whether or not horses require treatment, um, the most important threshold is 200 eggs per gram. So I want to show the same graph with the y-axis increased. And, and so that's what's happened here. The y-axis has just been increased here so that you can clearly see 200 eggs per gram and 500 eggs per gram. And it's the same ordered horses, all right, in three different categories, all right? Shown here in green, are all the low shedders. So all the horses that have under 200 eggs per gram in their feces. The orange uh, donates all the horses that are moderate shedders, and the red indicates all the horses that are high shedders, right, in this population of 261 horses on 12 farms. So you can see the low shedders constitute more than 50% of the total horse population. In fact, 55% of all the horses are in that category. They don't need amphalomentic treatment. The moderate shedders constitute approximately 18% of horses, and the high shedders constitute just 27% of horses. So that's the proportion of horses in each of the groups. And the bottom line is typically, as I've mentioned before, typically at least half of horses at pasture are low shedders and don't require amphalomentic treatment. I think the other thing to ask yourself is, if you look at those three groups of horses, how many eggs, if you look at all the strongyle eggs being shed into the environment, are each of those groups producing? The low shedders are just shedding 4% of all the eggs into the environment. The moderate shedders are shedding 13% of the eggs into the environment. And the high shedders are shedding the vast majority of all the eggs. They're shedding 83% of all the eggs into the environment. So those are the three groups of horses uh, and the level of egg shedding in each of those three groups. What happens when you come in now and treat them all with a drug such as ivermectin when it was initially introduced and had an efficacy, well, it had an efficacy of at least 99.9%. What happens if you only treat the animals that require anthelmintic treatment? So you only treat the moderate and high shedders and leave untreated all the low shedders. Not surprisingly, this is what you see. So you've left untreated all the low shedders, and there's been a 99.9% .9 reduction in egg output of the moderate and high um, egg shedders. You can see it's not disappeared completely because it, the drug is not 100% efficacious. What's been the impact of doing that? Overall, in this entire population of horses, just by treating the moderate and the high egg shedders, the total egg shedding into the environment, so what's resulting in environmental contamination, total egg shedding has dropped by 96% just by treating the moderate and high shedders. As a result of that though, untreated horses now are shedding 98% of all the eggs into the environment. And those will be drug susceptible eggs because they've not been exposed to an anthelmintic. The only parasites that have been exposed to anthelmintics are the, uh, are the parasites in the moderate and the high shedders. The treated horses are now shedding only 2% of eggs. And you can see why this is now the recommendation because if you do this, you're maintaining large numbers of susceptible parasites in the environment. Only a minority of eggs being shed into the environment are potentially drug resistant. All right, and so that's why this approach to parasite management is now being recommended. What happens though, if you use a drug with 90% efficacy? And I've put this up because that's effectively what they're seeing now in the Kentucky area with ivermectin, all right? It's no longer 99% efficacious, it's only 90% efficacious, certainly on the farm that I've just mentioned, but there's suspicion it's on a number of other farms also in the Kentucky area. So this is exactly the same before with a drug that's only 90% efficacious. Again, 
So what happens in that population of horses, the same low shedders are left untreated, but this is what happens to the egg output in the moderate and the high shedders. It doesn't drop as much because the drug now, and this is equivalent to ivermectin in that Kentucky farm, is now only 90% efficacious. What's been the impact of that? Well, now, so this is only dropping from 99 to 90% efficacy, but by definition, that's a low level resistance to ivermectin. Untreated horses now are shedding only 31% of eggs into the environment. Treated horses are now shedding 69% of eggs into the environment. So you can see once you start getting significant levels of resistance, the benefits of what is referred to as selective treatment, treating only those horses that need treatment, drops. So what are the conclusions from horses from what I've set, showed you? Number one, and this is a mantra that going forward, I think increasingly we have to consider, leave at least some horses untreated at each deworming. It's no longer sustainable to deworm all horses every time. And there's a particular urgency to introduce what I've referred to as selective treatment programs now for both ivermectin and moxidectin before we start seeing the resistance that they're describing in um, Kentucky. Although the reality is, um, with the move in particular thoroughbreds across the border, we've probably got these already. And I'd encourage you um, to start looking for this resistance that they're seeing in Kentucky. The other conclusions that this also, I think, generates for horses is that we should keep the frequency of anthelmintic or dewormer treatments to a minimum when environmental pasture refugia levels are low. So for instance, in hot, for instance, in hot, dry summers during drought periods, when there's very likely minimal numbers of parasites on pasture, that's not a good time all right, to be treating horses, particularly if you're gonna treat the whole group because there's no parasites in the environment uh, in refugia. The other thing we're increasingly realizing is that, and there's some nice modeling studies that have indicated that the same applies during um, our winters. Um, particularly late winter and early spring, small strand oil burdens on our pastures appear to be very low, all right? And so you've got to be careful um, about treating at these times of the years. The last thing is, for those of you that went to vet school as long ago as I did, it commonly, a commonly promoted program for both horses and small, small ruminants was what was called dose and move. And that was treat all your horses, and move them onto pasture this year that's not been grazed by any horses. And beyond the end of June, it appears that our pastures are completely clear, clean of small strand yards if they've not been grazed that year. That's what I was told to do when I was a vet student. That now is one of the strongest ways of selecting for resistance. I just can't work out why my faculty didn't know that. Because what you're doing is you're treating all of the horses, the only parasites remaining in them are drug resistance, and you're moving them to pasture that's completely clean, so the only parasites they contaminate the pasture with are drug resistant parasites. So what's our understanding now of risk factors for development of anthelmintic resistance? And this has really only come out of a number of studies in the last few years, and particularly some very elegant modeling studies that have looked at what factors select for anthelmintic resistance. And I think some of us, or many of us for many years, I think thought this was very likely gonna be the case. Number one, it won't surprise you, the more you treat horses with anthelmintics, the greater the number of frequency of anthelmintic treatments a year, the greater the risk of developing anthelmintic resistance. The next thing that determines whether or not you're likely to select for resistance, and this, is, this all comes from what I've just gone over with you, whether or not the control program maintains parasites in refugia determines very much whether you strongly or don't select for resistance. And it's very clear, both from some field, but particularly some very um, detailed modeling studies, selective treatment, treating only horses that require it, significantly delays resistance. The other thing that I've not mentioned, but has come out of one of those big modeling studies, that there's a very close relationship with climate. Uh, and that that modeling study indicated that month of treatment has a very large effect on the risk of resistance development if you live in parts of North America with cold winter climates. Folks, I'm afraid that's us. And what that means is because month came out, 
uh, and it was associated with winter climates. If you deworm horses during the winter months, particularly treat all horses during the winter months, that strongly selects for resistance. And I mentioned the danger of that earlier on. The other two things that won't be surprising, underdosing certainly selects for resistance. And the other thing I'm gonna come back to at the end is a lot of resistance arises on farms, not because you or your clients induced it, but because they imported a horse that was infected with drug resistant parasites. The last question I want to ask before focusing on some of the things we should be discussing with our clients about parasite control programs is this issue. And that is if you look at all the published literature about the descriptions of anthelmintic resistance in small strand giles, almost all of it is on upper end farms. And I think the obvious question is why is that? Now, I certainly some people said to me, well, they're obviously the people who are gonna get faculty at vet colleges to go out and investigate things. And, and maybe that's true, but talking to quite a few folks, I think there's a number of other issues that may be at place. And that is typically, and feel free to disagree with me on this, Typically, deworming or anthelmintic treatment programs historically have been more aggressive than average farms. Whole group treatment, I think it's often common, and certainly from one or two of my trips to Kentucky, that's, that's been a common experience. And I think on average, parasite refugia in the environment is less than average farms. And I think that's perhaps because they're doing a good job at picking up feces and trying to uh, reduce environmental contamination, perhaps better than average farms. So in light of everything I've mentioned, what should be the primary objectives when you're working with your clients to design a parasite control program? Number one, I think there's two things. Number one, work with them to control strongyl egg shedding, parasite egg shedding to a level that minimizes the risk of parasitic disease. And number two, talk to them about what they can do as far as using anthelmintics in a manner that will reduce the risk of selection for anthelmintic resistance. So I think there's five things that you can potentially discuss um, with your clients. Number one, before you discuss anything else, to talk about things that can be done to manage the environment. Then talk about optimal use of dewormers or anthelmintics. To what extent can you implement a targeted treatment program that is treating horses only when they require treatment and also using them in a selective manner. And that is treating horses not only when they need it, but if they need it. So your selective treatment means you're only treating the horses that require treatment. So with egg counts, more than 200 eggs per gram. I think it's very clear that whatever you do, monitor to keep an eye on whatever you're doing and to what extent that is or is not controlling parasite burdens. And I'll just make one comment about biosecurity because there are some issues to appreciate as far as trying to minimize the risk of introduction of drug resistant parasites in horses. So let's talk a few things about pasture management. It's first important- Dr. Peregrine, I, yeah. I just had one question here. Mm -hmm. um, with respect to imported horses, do you suggest doing anything differently to minimize introduction of resistance? Yes, I do. And I'm gonna come, thanks Jessica, that's a great question. I'm gonna come back to a slide that covers the specific recommendations for imported horses. All right, um, the best recommendations, they're not perfect, but I'll come to that at the end, all right? So as I said, the first thing to do with your clients is to talk to them about what they can do as far as managing um, pasture contamination. This is a diagrammatic representation of what probably typically happens on Ontario farms. This goes from January to December on the x-axis and the y-axis indicates the number of small strand giles on pasture. And typically from, from, the, from the middle of the winter, January onwards, parasite burdens are decreasing. Uh, and the reality is, although some small strong giles do survive till the end of June on pasture, all right, a lot of them tend to die during the winter months, particularly with freeze thaw cycles, all right? But then what ha typically happens, we often will turn horses out May, June time, um, and if they're not infected at that point, because the youngsters have not been out before, if they go out at that point, they will acquire infections, start contaminating their environment. And so typically parasite burdens are the highest into the second half of the grazing season. So yes, small strand can overwinter on pasture till the end of June. Beyond that, pasture is essentially clean. 
but the burdens do start decreasing um, over the winter and spring months, which is, which is why in the early spring, it appears the burdens are very low and it is a potentially dangerous time of the year to be treating all the horses with an anthelmintic. And I'll come back to that particular issue. What influences the survival of small strangile eggs and larvae on pasture? There's really, well, there's a number of things, but temperature is particularly important as is humidity. And these are just a few figures, I think, just to remember, because they do drive um, recommendations for managing the environment. If the average daily temperature is between 25 and 33 degrees centigrade, right, that's the optimal temperature for eggs to mature to the infective uh, third stage larvae. It happens very quickly within a few days, all right? And at that temperature, they can survive a few weeks on pasture. But that typically, that's not our average summer temperatures. I think our average summer temperatures are in this range between 10 and 25 degrees. At that temperature range, eggs in feces mature to the infected third stage larva in two to three weeks. The relevance of that is if under our typical conditions, if you rotate horses out of a pasture within two to three weeks of placing them in that pasture, they won't reinfect themselves. All right. But the other thing to note is that at that average daily temperature, the infective forms can survive in the environment for weeks to months. And that determines whether or not rotation programs are or are not effective. I think a lot of people think that by definition, rotation is the way forward. But if you rotate horses back onto a pasture within one, particularly one to two months of leaving that pasture, the vast majority of infective parasites are still there um, because our, at our typical summering temperatures, parasites can survive on pasture for a number of months. Once we get freezing conditions, that starts killing parasites, particularly when they're repeated freeze-thaw cycles. Uh, and that's why typically over the winter months, our burdens of small strongyles progressively decrease. Now I said temperature is important, Humidity also is important. Uh, and as a rule of thumb, as a rule of thumb, if you're mowing the, this is my mantra every year, if I'm mowing the lawn at home every week during the summer months, that's a good year um, for parasite survival on pasture, right? Temperature and humidity drive survival on pasture. It's impossible to say exactly what is happening every year unless you start monitoring animals during the summer months. But what else can you recommend that has been shown to be highly efficacious for minim minimizing parasite burdens? If you regularly remove feces, and for a number of decades, it's been known that if you remove feces from pasture just twice a week, just that and nothing else, it can have a dramatic impact on small strongyle burdens. I think the obvious question is if you start doing that, what do you do with all the feces? Uh, and I'm well aware historically, people would have harrowed the feces um, as fertilizer. If clients want to use the feces as, as fertilizer, then composting is the option, all right? And if you compost feces under our typical summer conditions for at least two weeks, that essentially kills all parasites, um, all small strangiles, and in fact, ascarid eggs in feces, uh, as long as you turn over the feces in the compost heap um, during that time period, so that all of it um, gets exposed to moderate temperatures. This last thing is just a reminder, non-composted horse manure as a rule of thumb should never be spread on pasture. Like harrowing horse feces during the summer months does exactly what the horse parasites want, and that is to get out of the feces. As I said, if you want to use it for fertilizer, encourage, if the owner wants to, encourage them um, to start composting their feces. Few other, um, few other comments about pasture management. I mean, Number one, avoid high stocking densities. As a rule of thumb, if you can keep the stocking density low to no more than one horse per two acres, you shouldn't have a significant small strongyle burden at all. Now, I realize that's a luxury for many, all right? Um, but it is an option for some people. Pasture rotation, I've already mentioned this. Talking to horse groups over the years, it's very common I hear, well, obviously pasture rotation is the answer. It minimizes parasite burdens. As I've mentioned already, it very much depends on the climate, right? But particularly here in Ontario, reusing the same pasture more frequently than once every two to three months may not be associated with low, low parasite burdens, all right? Again, 
what is or is not working well each year, it's going to vary by year, but if you start monitoring, you can tell clients whether um, the things they've introduced are being beneficial to parasite burdens. Lastly, one comment about youngsters, typically under two to three years of age, ideally those should be grazed on the cleanest pastures each year, just because they're much more susceptible to significant parasite burdens and ideally keep them separate from other age groups of animals. So that's environmental management, which should be um, the number one discussion topic with clients before we start talking about using anthelmintics. Next issue, if you're gonna use anthelmintics, and the reality is on most farms, you do need to do some anthelmintic treatments. They should be used in a targeted manner. That is, you should only be giving them to horses when they need them. That's what targeted means. And the recommendation, this is just a quote from the AEP, focus treatment at the times of the year that are most ideal for larval development in the environment, all right? So that's typically during our grazing season, not during the winter months. Why? Because there's significant numbers of parasites in the environment in refugia. It reduces the rate of selection for anthelmintic resistance. So use anthelmintics as a targeted time of the year. And so here that's typically just the grazing season for small strong gels, not the winter months. And the other thing is when you're using anthelmintics, make sure you're not using them too frequently. Um, so the first issue is use intervals between treatments that are based on assuming those drugs should, should be fully effective. Let me explain this. This is the life cycle of small strongyles in horses. Once they ingest the infective stage, it develops in the wall and then eventually matures to the adult in the lumen or large intestine. If you treat a horse with fenbendazole, benzimidazole, that essentially just eliminates adults and some immature adults. That's just the same with pyrantel. If you use ivermectin, that eliminates all those parasites and some more of the immature parasites. And if you use moxidectin, so that's Quest, that eliminates almost the entire parasite burden. When those drugs are fully effective, this is how long the feces should remain free of feces. So if you're using fenbendazole, if they're fully effective, the feces should remain free of eggs right, for four to five weeks. We refer to that as the egg reappearance period. It's exactly the same for pyrantel, so that's strongid or exodus. It's longer for ivermectin because more life cycle stages are eliminated. It's six to eight weeks. And with moxidectin, it's 10 to 12 weeks. That's how long the feces should remain free of eggs. That's a relevant figure because that also should be the minimum interval after treatment with any of those drugs that you consider using another uh, anthelmintic in that animal later in the grazing season. One issue that I'm often asked is, well, what about rotation of anthelmintic classes? Shouldn't we be doing that to reduce the risk of selection for resistance? There's actually no evidence that no rotation, fast rotation or slow rotation is better than, than, any, one of the, than any of the other options, all right? Um, and there's particularly no evidence that rotation slows the development of anthelmintic resistance. In fact, many people now argue that rotation creates a false sense of security because you're switching every time to a different drug class. And so it actually masks the development of resistance. The reality is on many farms across North America, as I've already mentioned, the AEP recognizes that only ivermectin and moxidectin now work uh, and are fully efficacious against small strongyles. All right, and so rotation of drug classes for small strongyl control on many farms is actually a moot point. Next issue is that wherever you're working, all horses on, on a given farm should be on the same parasite control program. And I, I realize that can be difficult in some situations, but it doesn't make sense for different horses on the same property to be managed in a completely different way. Um, and I'd encourage you to get together with all the other vets on the same property to get a consensus opinion on what is optimal for all the horses on that property. But the thing you certainly should be discussing with clients, are you sure that when they're treating their horses with an anthelmintic, they're getting the correct dosage? Because as I mentioned earlier on, underdosing strongly selects for resistance. So that's targeted treatment. What are your options for selective treatment? So you should be treating horses at the time of the year when they need it, 
ideally in a selective manner, so treating only those horses that need the treatment. Well, it won't surprise you that to do this, and some of you may roll your eyes at this, but to do this, you need to do quantitative fecal egg counts. You need to know the number of strongyl eggs per gram of feces. And you really have two options if you're doing this. And I know a number of people are certainly doing this during the grazing season. There are centrifugal fecal flotation methods that diagnostic labs can do, right? That gives you the number of eggs per gram of feces. There's also the McMaster method. The McMaster method is a lot cheaper than centrifugal flotation methods. As to which is more appropriate, it depends what your objective is. But if your objective is only to determine are horses shedding more or less than 200 eggs per gram of feces, and that's the only information you require, the McMaster method is a lot cheaper to request than centrifugal fecal flotation that gives typically the exact number of eggs per gram, for instance, down to almost one egg per gram. But if, you, if all you want to know is, are horses shedding more or less than 200 eggs per gram, the McMaster method is by far the cheapest. So selective treatment requires you to do quantitative fecal egg counts. I think what's particularly interesting in the last, just the last two or three years, has been what's come out of the US uh, and a company called Parasite. Uh, and actually, I, and my understanding is Dr. Nielsen at the University of Kentucky worked with them because he, um, initially developed um, a smartphone app for doing quantitative fecal egg counts in horses. Uh, and they've now extended- Dr. Peregrine, I just have one qu question, sorry. Um, one question, is the Wisconsin count a, a centrifugal method? Uh, yes, it is, okay. typically, Thank you. typically it is. Just ask the lab to confirm that. So the Cornell Wisconsin method, which I think is what you're referring to, uh, is a centrifugal fecal flotation method, all right? As I said, I, you know, doing quantitative fecal egg counts, it's, it's laborious and time consuming, but certainly some equine vets are doing it. I think this is a particularly interesting development because it's now a semi-automated fecal egg count system that's now been commercialized by this company called Parasite in the US. It's a system that's now applicable for horses, sheep, and other animal species. Uh, and I actually spoke to Dr. Nielsen and the company just yesterday there's a large number of equine um, clinics across the US that have now, are now using this system. Um, I should just point out, I have no shares in this, so I hopefully am not biased here. I think it's interesting because a lot of equine clinics in the US have started using this. Um, and typically what, this is all the equipment that you lease from the company. And so there's a monthly lease rate. Um, uh, and then what you'll notice is there is no microscope. Uh, and so what happens is you basically in the practice in a very simple manner process the fecal sample and then you just literally um, put it into this machine which is like a glorified smartphone now uh, and it automatically reads it. Um, my understanding is the cost per horse fecal typically to vets is typically somewhere between seven and ten US dollars each. There is a monthly lease rate. I did ask them are any practices, um, horse practices in Canada using this? And they said they, they have certainly a number of clients in um, Canada that are already using this. Um, so it's interesting um, because it's enabling practices to process a large number of samples um, um, rapidly, quickly, uh, and, and semi-automatically. There's no microscope work required at all. If you want to look into it further, there's a website location there. So those, those are two options um, for doing quantitative fecal egg counts, that's selective treatment, the other thing that I think is particularly interesting, and I know a number of you are already doing this, and that is recommending something the AEP has recognized, and that is over the last 10 years, it's quite clear there's a genetic basis to the level of small strongyl egg shedding. This initially was described, again, by Dr. Nielsen, although this is from work he did in Denmark, on over 400 horses on 10 farms. And what he did was he collected two fecal samples from all of those horses every year for two and a half years and determined the small strongyl eggs per gram in all those horses. And what he found was horses with low fecal egg counts, so that's low shedders, less than 200 eggs per gram, typically very consistently remained low egg shedders year after year. Likewise, high egg shedders, more than 500 eggs per gram, consistently remained high egg shedders year after year. I've actually started doing this with our teaching horses and I've been doing it the last 10 years. 
it's uncanny. I can almost always categorize every horse's egg output purely on the basis of its name. So, I mean, the students tell me what the name is, but I don't tell them because I get them to do the egg output, but almost consistently, names I know that are high shedders are high shedders, low shedders remain low shedders. I know some of you are doing this and the AEP is now recommending this um, for those of you that would like to embrace this particular issue. And they're recommending that ideally, working with your clients, you determine the egg shedding status. So this is the small strongel egg shedding status um, of all horses on properties that are three years of old age or older. How do they recommend you do this? They recommend you collect feces from horses at least four weeks beyond the egg reappearance um, for any given, given anthelmintic. Um, so for instance, if they last were dewormed with fenbenders or pyrantel, the egg reappearance is four to five weeks, add another four weeks to that. So you wait at least nine weeks after that treatment, and then you collect fecal samples at that point. The reason for this is you just want to maximize parasite exposure so that in a population of horses, there will be high, medium, and low egg shedders. These are the figures, the wait periods following ivermectin treatment and moxidectin treatment. And I know a number of you are doing this. And the recommendation is you do this on horses once they're three years of age or older, twice um, on two different years, right? And then you classify horses based on those two counts. So after two years, you classify horses as low, medium, or high shedders. And it's on the basis of doing that, these are now the most recent recommendations from the AEP for deworming for small strong gels, particularly in the northern parts of the US and here in Ontario. So for horses three years of age and older, what they're recommending is, what they're recommending is all horses should receive two treatments per year, all right? That is referred to as the foundational treatment all right, and for low shedders, what they're saying is that should be all that's required. All right, and they're recommending you do that in the spring and the fall, when typically there are highest burdens of parasites on pasture. So that's the foundational treatment for all horses, spring and the fall, and you only do additional treatments for horses that have been defined as moderate or high egg shedders. Remember, in this system, once you've defined a horse as a low, moderate, or high egg shedder, you never do a fecal egg count again on those horses unless you've got concerns. Now that's for small strong gels. Um, what about those of you that do preventative treatment for bots? Well, the only drug class that works for bots is the macrocyclic lactones, and we do that always in the fall anyway. And if you want to include a preventative treatment for tapeworms, and I'll make a few comments about that in a second, all right, that's uh, the recommendation is include that treatment with the full preventative treatment um, for small strong gels. So what would that look like for those of us here in Ontario that have been here quite a number of years that have used ivermectin for many years? Historically, ivermectin typically was given every two months throughout the year because of the egg reappearance of every six to eight weeks. That was what was recommended. What the AAEP is now saying is for low egg shedders, they only require the ivermectin treatment at the beginning and effectively the end of the treatment, uh, at the end of the grazing season, all right? They're recommending that for all horses, low, medium, and high shedders, but for low shedders, those are the only tre treatments that should be needed. Moderate and high shedders are the only horses that re should re receive additional preventative treatments during the grazing season. Now, you may look at that and go, well, hang on. If you do that, you're not doing selective treatment at the beginning or the end of the grazing season. And I agree, all right? But you are doing selective treatment during the grazing season. You're only treating those animals that are a moderate high shedders. The one thing I will say is, there's a study that's just again come out of Dr. Nielsen's lab that is starting to question very seriously whether in Canada, whole group treatment at the beginning of the grazing season um, whether that's actually sound. There's increasing evidence that it's particularly important, ideally, to do selective treatment at this time. I think the, the door's open on that issue at the moment, but do recognize in this system, you're treating all animals at the beginning of the grazing season. Selective treatment is just for moderate and high shedders during the grazing season. What are they recommending? 
for, for animals under three years of age, so for yearlings and two-year-olds, what they're saying is assume they're high egg shedders and manage them as high egg shedders. So typically they will require three to four treatments per year during the grazing season. And again, you'd include preventive treatment for bots and tapeworms at the end of the grazing season. The other two things the AUP is strongly recommending that whatever you do, and we've talked about lots of options for managing the environment and different ways you can use amphimintics, they are strongly recommending that ideally you should monitor the efficacy of the deworm you're using on a farm every year um, for small strongels. And the best time of that year to do that would typically be in July, August, when egg output typically will be at its highest. And they're recommending for all possible do a fecal egg count reduction test, all right? And that is select six representative horses, wait until it's at least two months after the last deworming, and then do fecal egg counts, so the number of small strangel eggs per gram of feces in at least six horses. You, so you do that, you deworm the horse, so you're confident they've been treated at the correct dosage, and then collect fecal samples two weeks, 14 days later, and repeat the fecal egg counts and then determine the average reduction in the fecal egg count. So to what extent has the average egg count changed over that 14 day period following treatment? Just so that you understand what these figures mean, if the average egg count before treatment was 1,000 eggs per gram, and 14 days later the average egg count was 500 eggs per gram, that's a 50% reduction. If it dropped from 1,000 to zero over 14 days, that's a 100% reduction. How do you interpret the reduction? Dr. Peregrine? Yes. Um, we have some questions here. Mm -hmm. um, first, could you stagger the spring treatment to slow down resistance? For example, half the horses in a pasture one month and the other half a month later. Yes. Because you're starting, you're st I mean, it's, yeah, it's better than whole treatment, Jessica. All right, you're not, okay. so that's, so yeah, you're right. If, if, if whatever you do is ensures you're not treating everyone at the same time, all right? So yeah, you're, you're doing a type of selective Okay, treatment. okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you've got to work with producers, it's not only producers, farmers, determine what's appropriate for them. Um, second question, uh, for a low shedder, would you first, would you use first and last frost as a guideline for when to treat in spring and fall? Yeah. That's, that's a good okay. guidance. That's a good guidance, certainly. And I, uh, sorry, go on. No, no, you go ahead. No, I, I think the concern going forward is going to be the impact of climate change on this. And, and you know, once, yeah. once we start getting milder winters, we're going to start be dealing with what they deal with in Northern Europe, which is significant overwintering of parasites on pasture. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, there are concerns. And you can argue with more overwintering, perhaps there's less, there's more refugia in the spring but you're more likely with that system to see significant disease during the grazing season. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Okay, um, and the third question, which I think is the final one right now, for farms that are reluctant to do fecals on every horse, any recommendation on which horses should be targeted in the group with limited finances? That's a tough one. I, I mean, on, from I mean on, that's a tough one because, because of the variation within a population, but on, on average, the younger animals are gonna have typically higher egg counts. It's one of the reasons I like this genetic basis to selective treatment because you just do two fecals and that's it. I, I realize mm -hmm. if you want to do fecals every year on all the horses every year and multiple times during the grazing season, that often becomes prohibitively expensive. Having said that, Jessica, I mean, I, at face value, it looks prohibitively expensive. People who have costed it and the saving that results by not, for instance, treating 50% of the horses, typically the saving from not treating 50% of horses more than offsets the increased cost of fecal testing. The genetic basis, I think, is a, is, is a better system for people where, where finances are very limited because you determine the okay. status and that's it after two years. Is that okay? Okay. Yep, that's great. Thank you. So I just, we talked about doing fecal egg reduction tests and then how do you interpret them? These are the figures provided by the AAEP. As I've mentioned, the drug class they're now recommending for typical prevention of small strangels are the macrocyclic lactones, ivermectin and moxidectin. When they were fully efficacious, 
people saw at least a 99% reduction in egg output. If it drops by 95 to 98%, they're saying that's suspected resistance. But once it's less than 95%, so for instance, it only drops 90%, as in that farm in Kentucky, that's by definition resistance. And folks, I've given you my email address. If you ever want to chat about this, um, please feel free to get in touch. Lastly, don't forget a lot of resistance is associated by importing horses with drug resistant parasites. All right. And so what's recommended by the AEP for all new arrivals is to do a strangile fecal egg count. For horses that are staying on a property for six weeks or less, the recommendation is treat with ivermectin because it's part of the drug class that's most likely to be efficacious, all right? Animals staying longer, uh, the recommendation is using moxidectin because it typically eliminates more parasites. And ideally, all right, then turn them out onto pasture that you think is significantly contaminated with parasites. I haven't talked about Parasporus aquorum, um, roundworms and foals. The one drug class that still seems to be efficacious with Parasporus is fenbendazole, the benzimidazoles. And so the recommendation for foals, all right, coming on um, to manage them in the same way, but treat them with fenbendazole, all right? It's the one drug class that's still efficacious. And just before I finish, two concluding things. I wanted to make one comment about tapeworms. The general consensus is now that a single treatment every year typically is beneficial for horses. The problem at the moment is we don't have a good diagnostic for tapeworms and we're still looking for that. Just so that, you know, even the AEP now says this, there's no evidence that more than one preventative treatment a year um, benefits um, horse health. And under our conditions, probably the best time to do preventative treatments for tapeworms uh, is in the fall. So that's the time of the year you should be seeing these combination products. So ivermectin and praziquantel or moxidectin and praziquantel. If you live in parts of the prairie provinces or similar uh, where it's extremely dry and arid, the reality is you almost certainly um, do not have a tapeworm problem, but that's very different under our climate conditions here. And lastly, and I, 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 I'm going to keep mentioning this, Jessica, at every horse talk until I drop dead. And that's, that's this issue. Um, and that is, what is one other thing we as an industry, as a profession, could do to potentially slow the development of resistance? And it's this question. What about making anthelmintics for horses prescription only and removing availability over the counter? Denmark did this in 99. All right. Um, and beyond 99, um, vets in Denmark had to do a fecal on a horse before an anthelmintic could be prescribed. So all prophylactic treatments were disallowed. You had to do fecals. And not surprisingly, the amount of anthelmintic treatment dropped dramatically. A bunch of other um, countries across um, Europe also have introduced similar legislation. Um, 13 years ago, this is 2009, Jessica, um, a bunch of us put this letter in the Canadian Vet Journal, questioning this issue, hoping to get a discussion. All I'll say is there was zero response, all right? And I'm happy to talk to folks perhaps about getting that discussion getting again, but I do think putting anthelmintics back into the hands of vets, um, although the optics of that, um, in some countries are not brilliant because then we're considered as having monopoly. But the argument in these countries, it has helped um, people use anthelmintics in an appropriate, sound, progressive manner. So Jessica, that's everything I wanted to say. Just in summary, unless we change what we're doing at the moment, drug resistance is gonna get worse in small strong jars. Um, please, with your clients, talk to them about managing the environment just as much as we do about, or at least should do, with respect to using anthelmintics. There's lots of different options I've mentioned that you can discuss with your clients. I think as a mantra, no longer should we be deworming all horses at the same time. And whatever you're doing, monitor the effectiveness. Do fecals on a group of horses during typically July, August to determine whether what you've done up to that point in the grazing season is minimizing strongel egg output. And, and if nothing else, this is the one thing I think as vets, we need, we need to proactively do 
because I'm well aware, I think on a, on a lot of horse properties, the vets are not involved in parasite control, but I think we increasingly need to talk to clients to take ownership with them of parasite control. Jessica, I've talked enough. That's everything <laughs> I want to see. I, I hope that was helpful. Um, and, yeah, that's great. And if there are any other issues that we don't cover or haven't covered properly, please feel free to email or phone. Okay, great. I have um, uh, another question here. Would you change what you do for an imported horse or new addition based on having a low or high fecal egg count? What, so what do you mean, Jessica? I, I don't know. I think I think what they mean is um, relative to what oh, you talked about. Yeah. I, I mean, the recommendation is to do a fecal egg count when any horse comes into a property, whether it's been imported from another country or or another farm. All right. Do a fecal egg count. It is the question, would you do nothing? So would you do nothing um, if there was a low egg count? Um, I think many people would argue that if the egg count is low, so below 200 eggs per gram, there likely is still benefit, all right, of doing a treatment and looking at response to treatment, um, as long as you're using a fecal diagnostic with a high level of sensitivity. So for instance, if it's only 150 eggs per gram and you wanna make sure the treatment's worked, you need to use a double centrifugation method, all right, um, to confirm okay. the treatment. Otherwise, there's a lot of evidence that a lot of resistance arises on farms um, because of importation. Uh, I mean, whatever you do, when you put the horse on pasture, make sure you put it on pasture that's heavily contaminated. There's been other horses. Because um, any treatment's not gonna eliminate all parasites, Jessica. Uh, and the whole idea is okay. then to dilute out those parasites in the environment. Okay, great. And then I have, uh, do you have any statistics on how effective manure removal is from pastures for controlling strong giles? Do I have any? Uh, no, um, other than a lot, a lot of anecdotal. Um, and, and if I could share, if I could share a story, a story, this is a true story. A few years ago, I was asked, I'll keep this somewhat anonymous. I was encouraged, I was asked to visit a standard bread farm somewhere in, in Ontario that had a significant problem with small strongels, like a significant problem. They also had a significant problem with tapeworms as well, um, clinical problem. Um, and but it was the small strong giles that were a particular issue. Working with that farm, we showed they had resistance to both fenbendazol and pyrantel, so they had double class resistance. That's not uncommon. And the the owner then said, "Well, what do I do now?" And I said, "Look, if there's one thing I can encourage you to do, pick up feces." So he said, "Well, well, what do you suggest?" I said, "Well, you can buy." And this person was not short of money, Jessica, as in extremely wealth, wealthy. They ended up paying 50,000 US dollars on the biggest poop sucker I, I think I've ever seen. Um, and over that, on over that grazing season, so it was, the, it was the first half of the grazing season I went there, but they bought this poop remover. That owner meticulously drove around every pasture for the whole of that grazing season and the grazing season beyond that. And all I can tell you is um, with minimal anthelmintic treatments uh, some months later, and particularly the following year, the average strangile egg counts dropped dramatically. Jessica, so it, it's anecdotal, but there's, it's been recognized, even if you go back a hundred years, people recognized before they even did fecals that if you picked up feces, it had a dramatic impact on parasite burdens in horses. Great, that makes, that makes sense. That was slightly fudging it, but anyway, anecdotes yeah. sometimes are all we have. Sometimes it is nice to have those numbers handy when you're dealing with a resistant client to tell them, you know, to try to kind of uh, steer them in one direction with, with so respect what I, what to environmental I would, management. Right, and Jessica, what I would say, one of the benefits of doing fecal monitoring is that then you have a benchmark going forward to show yeah. the client. Like for instance, you know, the average fecal egg count at the moment is 2,000 2, eggs per gram. You know, the, and then two months later, it, it's dropped. The next year, it's significantly lower at the same time. Um, and yeah. you can use that, I think, as leverage to show what is or is not working on that particular property. Mm -hmm. If you don't do fecals, you've got no benchmark to prove what yeah. you're doing is or is not beneficial. And even if you just do That's it, great. You know, just, just do it in a, you know, do it in six or seven horses. You don't have to do it on all if you're wanting to monitor progress. 
Okay, um, I have one other question here. What advantage is it to run a Wisconsin versus a McMaster? Would you catch more tapeworm burden? Uh, <laughs> so if the question is, which of those is more sensitive for tapeworms, the Cornell Wisconsin is significantly more sensitive. However, it still, excuse me, it sucks. Like, because the Cornell Wisconsin is probably the most sensitive fecal flotation method we have. It only on average detects 10% of infected horses. So it's a lot better than a McMaster if you're trying to look for tapeworm eggs, but it's still very insensitive. Um, if you're looking for horses, tapeworms in horses, number one, use a Cornell Wisconsin and look at feces from at least 20, 25 horses. All right, if you're gonna look for the presence of tapeworms. There are other diagnostics that are being developed in other parts of the world. There's a horse saliva um, antigen test that's available in Europe. Um, that's used to diagnose tapeworms, is much more sensitive. There are some fecal antigen tests that are being developed in other countries. So hopefully it won't be too long before we have those because we urgently need better diagnostics for tapeworms. Okay, great. Um, I think that was everything for the question. So um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Peregrine. You did a great job tonight and uh, we appreciate everything uh, with the presentation here. It was very informative. Um, and just a, a, a couple of reminders. So after today's webinar, probably sometime tomorrow, there'll be a, a survey that gets emailed out uh, just to kind of get your feedback and see how you what you thought about it, any any suggestions or recommendations you had going forward for the future, and it would be great if you could share that with us. Um, also want to remind everybody that the second uh, webinar in this series is, is coming up uh, June 20. Oops, Jessica, you've frozen. 28 at 7 p.m. Uh, Lyme's disease. Um, oh, am I back? You're back. <laughs> okay, I'm back. So I don't know if you heard, but the next webinar in the webinar series is Lyme disease with Dr. Tom Divers, uh, June 28th at 7 p.m. And again, a gentle reminder to fill out your quarterly surveys so we can direct the resources to where they're needed most. And otherwise, uh, the video will be posted on the internet. So on, on the OA website. Jessica, I sent you a copy of the handout if people want that. Yes, that's, that's right. If anybody wants a copy of the handout, um, we're happy to provide that. Um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Peregrine. No, you're welcome. Appreciate and as I said, it. if anyone wants to phone up and chat or email, please feel free to do so. I'm, I'm back at the office now. Oh, I have one more question that just came in. Oh, Jessica, you froze again. Um, should we be... Oh. You're back. Okay, should we... Oh no. Jessica, I'm sorry, you've frozen. We'd be spending the money for the Wisconsin test. That's okay. Uh, what, what was the question? Sorry, you're back now. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, should we be spending the money for the Wisconsin test or minimal advantage? Sorry, what was, sorry, what, I didn't understand the question, Jessica. Should we be spending the money for the Wisconsin test? Oh, Jessica, sorry, you've just frozen. If the, if the question- Or is there is, minimal advantage to spending the money associated with it? Oh, so, so if the question is, is it worth spending the money on a Cornell Wisconsin that can give you the number of eggs per gram down to one egg per gram, or is it better spending the money on a cheaper test like the McMaster? It very much depends what you're doing. If all you're doing is to determine, for instance, do horses have an egg output more or less than 200 eggs per gram, the McMaster is a much quicker way and cheaper way of doing it. If you're doing a fecal egg count reduction test, the recommendation would be to use um, a Cornell Wisconsin or a double centrifugal flotation method. So it just depends Great, what you. you're wanting to do. Okay, great, thank you. My internet connection held just okay. in time. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, hopefully you have a great night. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Peregrine. No, you're welcome. Thanks, Jessica. Take care, everyone. Jessica, thanks. Thank you, appreciate okay. it. Okay.